you a little glimpse, a little peek uh, into some of the uh, theory of the book, and uh, hopefully by the end as well. It, you know, we, we've written this book um, um, consistent with what a lot of you in, in our workshops have experienced. But we have many, many big ideas about how we want this to, to actually expand and be applied to the world at large. And one of our uh, bios on our webpage, you know, we say uh, uh, what the world needs now more than ever is real. Uh, and we hope that we can impart this on a much bigger uh, global scale beyond uh, just this. So, what do you really want in your life? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> that spell check on our Facebook. Just trying to type something in. Really yeah, Dwayne's, Dwayne's phone talks. Definitely. So how most of us would actually uh, answer that question, what do we really want in our life, is we want to be happy. And the whole premise and the pursuit of happiness has been certainly the... Uh, you know, the hallmark feature of the personal growth movement for the last 20, 30 years. And we're here to tell you that we're here to make a comment um, that this sort of premise that we have to be happy uh, creates all kinds of actual psychological suffering as well. When we mandate ourselves to this absolute path of having to be happy. Because do you actually know anyone that is happy all the time? Was Jesus happy all the time? Was Buddha happy all the time? Was Mother Teresa happy all the time? Was Catherine happy all the time? <laughs> I tell you, living with me, she is not happy all the time. We're not happy all the time, nor should we think that we should be happy all the time. The biggest stories of the enlightened ones in the history of humankind have been the stories of a lot of trial and tribulation and dark nights of the soul coming to great states of wisdom, and yet we in this kind of new age are so much in it for ourselves in terms of what is going to make me happy. Happiness is a very um, transient <coughs> emotion, actually, and it's supposed to be. And by the end of the talk, I hope we can illustrate to you that there's good reason for that. In fact, in our mind, you know, the pursuit of, of perfect and non-stop happiness produces more unhappiness than the unhappiness that is trying to help us escape from. There's something else much more important than just the pursuit of happiness. And we do this in this kind of um, state of uh, feeling unhappiness and we want to fix it. And we quickly start focusing on uh, so much outside of ourselves to pursue, to get, to acquire better job, a better body, better relationship, better house, whatever it is. And it all offers a promise that we are going to be happy. <clears throat> and yet the promise never ultimately delivers. Nor should it. There's good reason for that. And even when it does, we may complain it's the wrong size, the wrong color, the wrong shape. And we become unhappier the more we pursue this quest for perfect happiness. <coughs> we might also be a little more enlightened about it and instead embark on a path of self-improvement. I'm going to learn how to be a better person. And there's nothing inherently wrong on, with that goal. But if we look at how most of us pursue that particular goal, we find the idea that happiness comes from satisfying, pursuing and satisfying your individual needs in life. And this is kind of epitomized by the American dream. 
the American dream, right? We are here to go on this individual quest to fulfill ourselves or to actualize ourselves in some way. To make ourselves great again. And the reality is that in the Western world, we are more in debt, we are more addicted, we are more overweight, we are more medicated than at any other time in the history of an adult population. So this idea that that's what we're here for is actually causing us a lot of problem. Research has also very clearly shown that once human beings reach a level of subsistence, which means that we have everything we need to make our needs, to meet our basic needs in life, plus maybe a little bit extra, right? Just a little extra for stuff. <laughs> After we get to that level, more does not make you happier. When you're in poverty, obviously you're unhappy. There is no question about it. But once you reach the level of being able to subsist, plus a little bit of extra, no, it doesn't matter how much more you get, your level of happiness remains about the same. And ultimately, all of, and so many of you have heard us talk about this, the bigger and more worthy goal to aspire to is connection. There have been hundreds of books written now on something called attachment theory, and basically the message in that is that from birth to death, the thing that gives meaning and purpose to our lives as human beings is a sense of belonging and love and connection. Bottom line. And the lack of authentic connection contributes more to our, our unhappiness, our mental illness, our work absences, even our physical illness, than anything else. There has also been a ton of research that shows that human beings live happier, healthier, and longer lives when they feel connected, when they have strong relationships around them. People who are on their deathbeds consistently regret the time they have spent pursuing things. What is of most concern at the end of the day is the love given and the love received. We all want to feel like we have loved well and that the people that we have loved in our lives know that they are loved. So, uh, just as fitness is a byproduct of good exercise, happiness is a byproduct of good loving relational action. as we're going to discuss uh, soon, um, all the problems that we experience in life originated and occurred in our navigation, managing uh, really important relationships. They happen in that, what's going on here? What do I have to do? Who do I have to become? <coughs> they happened in the uh, sphere of relationship interaction, and they, they will only get sorted out there as well. In legitimate, real contact and connection. Happiness comes as a byproduct of something that occurs first, and that is connection. We really have to ask ourselves, what does that actually mean? And as much as we actually, if we really, really look deep inside, we all long for that connection. We came into the world longing for that connection. Things happen, we get scared, and we still long for that connection, but with the, with the sheer contemplation of making a legitimate, real, total connection, we run into our fear of pain, of what might happen. We could be rejected, we could be dismissed, we could be abandoned. And things happen or go on inside of us profoundly at a primal level. And rather than discussing that honestly, we replace that with strategy to make sure that that pain never gets seen or felt or triggered again. And we represent ourselves with a strategic self rather than an honest self. And our psyche is like metaphorically a house where in the basement we 
hide our fears and vulnerabilities of what we fear we actually are. Things that we made up in that navigation in relationship with important others. And the reason I say this is um, it's one thing to understand that. It's a, yet a whole other to know it and live in, in, a, in a legitimate state of connection and vulnerability. More on that as we move through this. And so instead of revealing our fears, my oh my, we live in a world where it's that certainly not supported to reveal our fear. We live in a world where our strategies are supported profoundly and everywhere we turn, messages are powerful. So instead we hide, pretend, or defend for the most part. Most of, if you asked yourself who you are, would be mostly comprised of those kind of characteristics that represent you in the world. And that is ultimately what gets us into trouble. So all of us have what we call a basement in our psyche. And this basement happens early in the life. When we're born, the very first part of us to get wired up is our emotional selves. After our fight or flight brain, our emotional being gets connected up. And that's because it facilitates bonding with our caregivers. So we're wired for connection before we are wired for anything else. To me, that has a spiritual reason for being, not just a psychological one. And our thinking brain, our ability to sort through facts, doesn't kick in until it starts to get a grip more around the age of five or seven. The first time you have a sequential memory is when that's first starting to kick in, when you can say A, B, C, D, E happened. And it doesn't fully connect until early adulthood. So whenever anything happens, particularly with people that are important to us, it is terrifying. And we don't have the ability to sort out the nuances of what's happening. And because of that, we make it mean something about ourselves. It might be something traumatic, like being abused, or something more subtle, as when some part of you is not seen or heard or validated. And that happens and we think, oh no, what is wrong with me? I'm not good enough. And so, an example or two from my own life. I was one of those little girls on the schoolyard that always found myself on the outside of my circle of friends. I would kind of get in there for a, for a moment, and then something, I would do something, I would know, have no idea what it was, and then I'd be out again, rejected. And friendships are really important to a child. So these were painful moments for me. Certainly, I made it mean in my basement that who I am is not good enough. And throughout my childhood, I also had one best friend. I was on a sleepover at my very best friend's house one night, and I woke up in the middle of the night to find one of the brothers standing over the bed. We were sleeping in a bunk bed. I was on the top, and she was on the bottom. And when we're frightened, we have an instinctive response to fight, flee, or freeze. And children more often freeze. And that's what I did. I just froze. I closed my eyes and pretended I was asleep. And he proceeded to sexually molest me. The whole time, I just had my eyes closed. I was pretending I was asleep. And as he left the room, there was a moment when there was a light coming from the hallway where I got a really quick glimpse of him. The next morning, as I was walking home with my friend, I told her what happened. And she said, oh no, don't tell your dad. My brother is going to get into so much trouble. And then she asked me all kinds of questions about which brother it was, because she had two older brothers. One of them would have been about 13, 12, and the other would have been older, 15, 16. And I didn't get a good look at him. Eventually she asked, was he big or was he little? And I said he was big, because to me he was big. The next time I went to her house, the younger brother came into the room and he was wearing the same shirt that I had very briefly glimpsed as he left the room. And I vividly remember that feeling of horror as it washed over me. Oh no, what have I done? I am a horrible, horrible person. I, had, uh, I grew up in, in, in a different kind of home than 
Catherine's for sure. I, I, I grew up in a home with a father that was a classic uh, Irish binge drinking alcoholic um, with three sisters and a mother. And when he drank, he was, uh, he drank to figure out how to come home and just raise hell and punish my mother. It was the sole object of what he was up to when he walked in that door. And it would be hell every time. He didn't come after the kids, he came after my mother. And uh, I'm going into big, long stories here tonight. You know, uh, one particular evening, I invited my good friend, Ronnie Miller, um, over for an overnight who came from a nice home. Looked a lot like Catherine's home. Nice home. People did nice things together. <laughs> Never knew anything about the things that went on in my home. And nor did I let any of my friends actually come to my home. I went to a Catholic school where people didn't live in the same neighborhood. So I kept my friends away. And so there's my friend Ronnie Miller coming over for an overnight. And it was a Friday night, and it was payday, and all happened. <coughs> when my father finally came in at one or two in the morning, uh, he just came in kicking the door down and wanting the whole neighborhood to know about his, his hatred, his apparent hatred for what my mother did to him in terms of having to get married. Now we couldn't continue having a baseball career when he was 22. My friend Ronnie Miller bolts up out of bed in pajamas, and it was a night as cold as tonight in January that year. And uh, barefoot, pajamas, middle of the night, he's running down the street barefoot two miles to his home, and I hightail it after him. I'm running down the street. What? What am I going to do if I can? catch up to him. What? Convince him to come back. That moment, my whole life went through, uh, you know, what I, I had as a suspicion of myself that I didn't belong, that I was inferior, there was something wrong with us and me, particularly because I'm male, I'm about to inherit the mantle. What was once a suspicion was an absolute conviction now. I had nowhere to go. And go to my friends, they, they now know about me. <clears throat> Found out. I certainly do not belong now. And I didn't, didn't go home to talk. Who am I going to go home to talk to? I'm there to stop crazy things from happening. So all of us have these moments where this basement forms. And sometimes it's obvious traumas like we're describing, and sometimes they're more subtle. But they all happen in relationship where we think, oh no, who I am isn't good enough to be loved. And in the very moment where we take on these suspicions about ourselves, we say, okay, who I am isn't good enough, what do I have to do now to get the love back? And we try behavior A, it doesn't work, behavior B doesn't work, behavior C, bingo, that works. Who I really am is not good enough, I will become behavior C. And in this way, we develop a strategic self to hide who we really are in the basement. And my behavior, see, based on my experiences on the schoolyard and with my friend, is that I learned how to read what others expected of me, and I learned how to adapt myself and please people. I did whatever it took to make somebody like me. And I decided I will never make a mistake. I have to be so I became a people pleaser, a performer, and a perfectionist. That was my strategy that hid what was going on in my basement. And it's important when we're talking about this, we're talking about it like it's a thought, but it's not a thought. It's more a feeling. We're describing it as a thought, but it is a feeling that who I am is not good enough somehow. And my behavior, see, was certainly become a little bit of a super. You know, all boys, when they get 11 or 12, decide I'm either going to be like my dad or unlike him, one of the two. And I certainly had decided I'm going to be anything but like my father. And so I became the rescuer of women. Rescued my sisters, rescued my mother. Got really, really good at it. I got, I got heralded in as some hero in my family system for how well I could do that. I also knew how to avoid. You know, Superman also knew how to fly away. Anybody here know where he would go for his private time? The 
fortress of solitude, the North Pole, sitting on a block of ice. That's where he had peace of mind. There was nobody there, nobody in relationship with. I learned how to fly and avoid. I'd rescue, and as soon as it got too close, because, you know, I don't want them to find out what's going down there with me, I would fly. I got really good at flying. I was known as the untouchable in high school. No girl could be with me. They, I was, they, they called me the untouchable. I thought, gee, that's like a superhero. Isn't that cool? I'm untouchable. I was in a lot of pain. I had a lot of problems. So this whole strategic self is hiding what we fear we are in the basement. And as we move through life, our strategies get more and more sophisticated. Well, this aspect of our real self stays pretty much the same in the basement where we left it. And all of those strategies are founded on getting something from the outside world to make up for what we fear we are inside. And certainly the thing I decided I needed was to find my soulmate. When I was a little girl, I read Cinderella and Snow White. And when I was a teenager, I read Harlequins. And despite the fact that I got my master's degree in clinical psychology and knew better, that promise had its things in its hooks right in my guts. The one. Go, seek, find the one. And when you find the one, you will finally feel okay about yourself. And so I went on my quest with all of my perfection and performing strategies. And I found one in high school who said to me, Catherine, I will never love you. And I said, okay, you're a tough nut, I'll take you. Because <laughs> if I can make you love me, then maybe I'll be okay. And so on, I continued through my first husband, no space between. And then when this guy entered my life, my whole life had crashed and burned. My relationship with my husband, I was still married when I met this guy, my relationship with my husband was tanked. And I see him on the stage and he is talking about relationships and spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> it is clear to me that he is the one. Here I come to save the day! <laughs> it is clear. Now, if I had been honest, this is how I would have introduced myself. I did not do it this way, but this is what I would have said. My life is in the toilet right now. I am desperate. I am desperate. I feel like I am nothing. I feel like I have nothing. I am lost. I have no meaning. I have no purpose. But I have this feeling that if you loved me, everything would be okay. <laughs> what do you think? Security! <laughs> so, what I really did was this. I put on my best, shiniest, strategic mask self, and I said, that was a brilliant lecture you just gave. Oh, really? It was brilliant. Wow. I loved what you had to say about relationship. Yeah, I, uh... I'm really into relationships. <laughs> <laughs> You've just distilled some very complex concepts down into something so clear and easy to understand. I was so impressed. And you have a uh, master's degree in clinical psych. I do, yes. So you understand what I... Yeah, the last relationship I was in is just an understanding thing I had to say. Oh. So I'm touched by that. Thank you. When you were talking about your experience in your last relationship, my heart just went out to you. It sounded so dramatic. <laughs> you have no idea. Listen, you know, I wouldn't say this in front of an audience. If I'd come up to me after the talk, but she was a nutcase. <laughs> it was horrible. It was, she was so hysterical. Always hysterical. I can't imagine ever being hysterical myself. <laughs> Kidding me? Does that actually exist? And she's got a master's degree in clinical psych. After what I have been through, I spent, I had two major relationships before her, and they were both hysterical. I got hauled over by the police in Honolulu on a vacation where we went on together, just having a conversation. It got so crazy. I thought I'd never be in a relationship again. What's the point? Yes! 
Christ, I was speaking up there about relationships, but, uh, you know, actually, I, I still don't know how to be in one. I don't know if I really want to be one, but she's not hysterical. Oh, but I understand your, um, your relationship uh, is not doing well. Oh, it's so sad. We have a tiny little child, and it's, it's I think we're done. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's one. <laughs> 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 we just, it's like we're living on two different planets. We just don't connect. You know, I, are you serious? Why on earth would you not want to connect with you? <laughs> it still works for me. <laughs> totally, it does. <laughs> and that's how it begins, right? Our strategies seem to get the thing that we want. And we start, and we're using our relationship as an example, but this is true of everything that we go to seek in life. Off we go to get it, and the thing comes closer, and the thing comes closer, and all of a sudden we think, <gasps> uh-oh, in the back of our minds, if you really knew me, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And that's where we start getting scared and anxious, and because we feel scared and anxious, we start doing our strategies more and more intensely, and our strategies end up delivering us to the very place we're trying to get away from. So what ended up happening in our relationship as we came together is the amount of time we spent together became an issue. And what I would do is do my little performing, pleasing, cheerleading trip. I would plan, I would praise. Come down from the North Pole, Dwayne! <laughs> I would do all of that. But remember, the strategy is meant to deliver. And when the strategy doesn't deliver, then I would start to get pissed off. Now, I kept my promise that I would not get hysterical. Instead, I practiced the fine art of passive aggression. <laughs> He would walk in the door, and I would permeate the atmosphere with my cold disapproval. Ice. <laughs> Sending it all over the place. And if he was bold enough to say, Catherine, is everything all right? Is everything okay, Kath? Do we have any of my kind in the room? <laughs> what, is, what is our typical response to that question? <laughs> because the point is he should figure it out for himself, right? <laughs> So I would get cold and passive aggressive. Now, Dwayne does not have a subtle bone in his body, so he didn't respond with subtlety to this tactic. How he would respond is... You know, Kath, I don't know. Maybe this just isn't working out. And I would say that not to end the relationship. I would say that because it worked. <laughs> not consciously. You know, it allowed me to not be too close and not too far at the same time because whenever I said that, she would kind of take care of business, move the goalposts, make everything okay. And so, typically what would happen is I would hear that and off I would go again. Uh-oh, better start planning and cheerleading and doing all my thing. And that is how we get ourselves stuck in these patterns that just deliver us to the very place we're trying to get away from. We keep doing these things that get ourselves there. We don't realize how much we're actually participating in the thing we're complaining about. And what's driving the bus for both of us and for all of us is what we're actually not talking about. The stuff that's going on in the basement is driving the whole thing. We don't even think about it, we certainly don't talk about it, and we certainly don't work it out. We just keep acting it out and playing it out. Oops. So, Carl Rogers said, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself as I am, then I can change. Isn't that a bit of a paradox? When you finally accept this is what I am and this is where I am, whatever it looks like in my house, underneath everything, once I actually accept it, I can begin to change it. We can't change it ever if we never actually accept it. We're just running from it in our pursuit of happiness upstairs with all our games we're playing. So rather than hiding our fears by locking them away in that basement and donning forever that, 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 that crazy uh, strategic personality, we have to turn the other way and actually pioneer a path to the basement and let 
ourselves be vulnerable where we actually are vulnerable. You know, many other civilizations, there was rites of passage for this. It was part of becoming a human being, an adult. It was actually meeting yourself in so many different ways. We don't do that in the Western world. We do everything to avoid it. And we have no idea what we're losing. We're not here, folks, just to figure out a way of feeling pain. We're not really interested in that. We're interested in what happens once we address it and what opens up to us after that. And that means learning to stop just talking about it, which we're all so good at doing. You all have a great shelf help section at home. You can talk about it forever, but rarely do we talk from it. And that's what we have to do at some point. Until we talk from it. Until I let that 11-year-old up into the house, into the living room, to talk about what it was like on the street that day. All I'm doing is running from it. And hiding and pretending. And the quality of my life and my happiness, everything, it just, it's all goes out the window. So but without these masks and defenses, it creates an opportunity for simple, profound, <coughs> pure human vulnerability. There's a whole world waiting there for us, not just pain. And I knew this 15 years ago when we were in this cycle. I mean, I can't remember exactly how long it lasted, but it was years. <laughs> Not months, years, we did variations of this same dance. I could have written you a nice report about it all. Or the one on me. But, and a better one on Dwayne. <laughs> and this is not where the problem is, is in our understanding. Again, it's in our feeling. We are so quick to react out of that fear with our automatic program defense strategies. We, are, we don't want to stay long enough with ourselves to really be able to feel what is happening. And one of those days when he said, you know, maybe this isn't working out, Catherine, I finally did that. I finally took myself in hand and I said, what am I doing? <coughs> what am I doing trying to make this relationship work? I will make it work. When I do that, what am I saying to me about me? Essentially, I'm saying who I am as I am is not enough. What is that doing to Dwayne? If in fact this relationship isn't what he wants, I am depriving him of the opportunity to do what he needs to do with his life. And for the very first, and this is humbling to admit, to, because at that time I was also a counselor, for the first time in my life up to that point, I said, maybe I don't need somebody to love me for me to be okay. Maybe I can learn to feel okay about myself even in the absence of someone else validating that for me. And so I hung on to myself really, really hard. I said, that's the direction I'm going, no matter what. And I went to Dwayne and I said, I love you, and I really want this relationship to work. And the next time you say that to me, I will believe you. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Inside, your inside voice. <laughs> and I thought this took a couple of hours to come back to the table. Apparently it took me two days. For sure it did. Two days. <laughs> where I just kind of froze and went away. And we kind of froze the relationship like what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? And what normally happens here for most of us is because we don't go downstairs to the place and talk about what's going on down there, we fight. Couples argue and fight to, to keep being right about that it's not their problem, it's the other person's problem. 99.9% .9 of us, that's what we do. That's why we fight. But what, why else would we fight other than say, you're responsible for my pain? <coughs> and I kind of wait for two days, I think, for her to finally come back to the rules in the relationship that she would move the goalposts again, make it easier for me. 
back to the original deal, the original agreement. And instead, I came back and I said, I am sorry. I had said I'm sorry before. A lot, a lot of people do. Like, how else are you going to sort things up? Somebody has to say they're sorry. It doesn't mean you actually mean it. <laughs> Somebody has to just get this back to me. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. You know, here's some roses, you know. <laughs> That's what I mean. It means much more than let's, I can't stand this. So I'm saying, I meant this. I am sorry. You know, every time you invite me home, I have to visit the one I came from first. And I have been punishing you for what happened there. You had nothing to do with that. Nothing. And yet you get it all. That's not fair and that's not okay. I have a problem being close to a person person that I care about. So, person that I care about. I am so terrified that you're going to find something wrong with me. That I end up doing to women what I feared my dad was doing to me. So the moment I see disappointment, you are the problem. You got you got, you know, you you are this and you know, I, I I judge you. And that's not okay. I am frightened to death. Actually, letting somebody know me. You will never, ever, ever hear me ever again explain what's happening for me by what you're doing. Never. And I'm also sorry because despite the fact that my behavior might look prettier, I it also I have been trying to manipulate you, bottom line. And that's not fair. It's not fair to ask you to love me where I don't love me. It's not fair to ask you to validate me where I can't do that for myself. And I am committing <coughs> to taking responsibility for that myself instead of making it your job. I want to ask you for help with that, but I am no longer going to make it your responsibility. Yay! <laughs> like, yay! We have somewhere to go! Just think of that! Every relationship, folks, that comes to this crossroads has somewhere to go. Most relationships don't get past this place. And what we're talking about here, we're using our relationship as an example, but this applies everywhere. This applies with your friends, this applies with your family, this applies with your children. Vulnerability invites connection. There is nothing that invites the experience of vulnerability like that, or the experience of connection like vulnerability. And it is that feeling of connection that corrects the suspicions that we hold about ourselves. It's one thing to know better up here. It's an entirely different thing to feel it as well. And when we're brave enough to reveal ourselves, and say, this is who I am, and this is what I'm scared of, and we look into someone else's eyes, and we see acceptance instead of horror, it changes how we feel about ourselves. So that now what we know to be true matches how we feel. This world profoundly needs the very last thing it's prepared to do. All of our defenses only create more of the pain that we're trying to get rid of. We do this in relationship, primary relationship. We do this in our families. We do this with our friends. We do this in our communities. And we're doing it in the world. Just yesterday, I was watching uh, the news. And, and after all this American election business, and, and I mean, are you kidding me? Yesterday, watching Trudeau and there was tears in his eyes, and he sat with the, he met with one of the Syrian refugees that he had met at the border, and apparently Trudeau said to him at the first meeting, said, welcome home. And as this person was saying what that meant to him, to hear the prime minister of a country be that human, and loving and accepting, 
that uh, Chernobyl was in tears. He was just in tears. He couldn't contain himself. I thought, why, is, why isn't there more of this? Is that so bad? Is that so bad? We all need to be brave and to be courageous enough to be the one in your life wherever it is. We start in our relationship. Certainly this whole clear mind thing is about people learning how to become emotionally responsible human beings by stepping in to that territory, staying in there long enough to do something different and looking around about what does this world look like? Is it the one, the one I feared? We're all so terrified of it. And yet if we just stay in there long enough and start becoming emotionally responsible and start talking about self instead of about the other. You have no idea. So within that context of connection, we discover that who we are as we are is good enough, flaws and all. That is the overview to it all. And our ability to meet and accept and embrace our flaws is actually what saves our relationships as opposed to wrecks them. It saves them. It does not ruin them. And there's nothing to fear at the end of the day when you're brave enough to just be yourself. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to be authentic and loving and brave and honest and real. And if at the end of the day you decide love is what matters most in your life, we all have to risk being real. So thank you.